Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to the second in our 2021 season of Genome Mates brought to you by Welcome Genome Campus Connecting Science. My name's Becky Gilmore. I'm a white woman in my late 30s with short dark blonde hair. I use the pronouns she and her. Tonight we'll be talking about what animals can teach us about how and why we age. Since the beginning of lockdown, the Genome Gallery has connected scientists and researchers from the Welcome Sanger Institute's Cancer, Aging and Somatic Mutation programme with artists and uh, public participants over Zoom in their kitchens in a collaborative and creative project called Flocellular. This season of Genome Mates is part of the wider programme exploring um, this, this, this subject and, and its wider themes and we encourage you to visit the Genome Gallery website to find out more about the project and the science that underpins it. Through a changing programme of, um, of displays, the Genome Gallery encourages um, members of the public to explore genomics and research and, and to consider the way that um, that social and personal impacts can be felt from learning and exploring our genetic code. We hope that we can welcome you back to the gallery and to our campus experiences before too long. But in the meantime, we do encourage you, as I say, to uh, visit our website and, and explore um, our, uh, our events and our exhibitions in more detail. My colleague will post a link in the chat so you can find your way to it. Genomics research plays a vital role in our lives and has been centre stage in recent months in the fight against COVID-19. We are now living in an age where cancer will affect one in two of us over our lifetimes, which is a phenomenal thing to think about really. In 2021, this, this year we, we find ourselves in, we mark 25 years since the discovery of the BRCA2 gene mutation and the link uh, the link it has to inherited, uh, inheriting excuse me, the higher risk of, of breast and other cancers. This discovery revolutionised cancer research and has had a hugely positive impact on survival rates ever since. Tonight's discussion focuses on a pioneering area of research into cancer and ageing, studying patterns of DNA damage in, in the animal kingdom, so thinking away from ourselves for a moment, though of course we're animals too and why studying animals is so important for understanding and improving human health. Before we meet the panel, I'd like to take a moment to tell you about the format for this evening and briefly run through the event um, and some sort of general housekeeping that we'd like to mark. Our events aim to help everyone explore the science of genomics and what it means for all of our lives. We respectfully ask everyone to participate in a spirit of curiosity and sharing respecting different views, identities and experiences. We do moderate this platform to ensure that it's a safe and inclusive space for everybody. Closed captions are available for this event. Um, if you'd like to use them, um, you can enable them by clicking on the closed caption button, which you'll find either at the top or bottom of your Zoom screen, depending on the device you're using. The panel will chat um, this evening for about 50 minutes and then it'll open up to questions from you. We'd love your contributions, so don't be shy. Please use the Zoom Q&A box, again, which you'll find either at the top or the bottom of your screen. Type your question in there at any point throughout this evening, so you don't have to sit and wait on it. And don't worry if it looks like you're the only one asking the question. Um, they come back to a feed um, behind the scenes and my colleagues will be mod moderating those, looking through them and bringing um, as many of them together as possible so we can cover them through the rest of the event. We're delighted to welcome Jeff Marsh this evening, filmmaker, producer and presenter uh, of Science Radio and Podcasts, who will be hosting our conversation. Starting his work in life at Nature, Jeff has been fortunate enough to present popular science content for the likes of the BBC, Guardian, New Scientist and the Natural History Museum. His reporting has taken him all over the world, from hydrothermal vents in Iceland, chimpanzee communities in the Congo rainforest, supercomputers in Japan, and most recently the climate impact of Hindu Kush mountain range of Afghanistan. 
Jeff will be in conversation with Simon Spiro and Walter Bill from the Zoological Society London. Simon is the wildlife veterinary pathologist for ZSL. This means he's responsible for the diagnosis and study of diseases in the 30,000 animals across the ZSL London and Whitsnade zoos, primarily through post-mortem examinations. He's particularly interested in infectious diseases and is currently focusing on growing his knowledge of fish and invertebrate pathology. Rob manages the UK Cetacean Stranding Investigation Programme. This collaborative research programme is responsible for the investigation of UK stranded whales, dolphins, porpoise, marine turtles and some sharks. He has over 20 years experience in strandings, response, recovery and investigation, both in the UK and internationally. We're also fortunate to be joined by Jackie McKenzie Dodds from the Natural History Museum. Jackie has been working at the museum since 1991, first as a research assistant, then a molecular research manager. She's now manager of the Molecular Collections Facility. It's the museum's biobank launched in 2012, storing approximately 2 million specimens and samples from across the tree of life and made available to researchers worldwide. Last but by no means least is Alex Kagan. Alex is an evolutionary geneticist working in the Cancer, Aging and Somatic Mutations program at the World Consumer Institute. Combining laser capture microscopy and genome sequencing, he studies the range of animal species to understand how DNA damage contributes to cancer and ageing. He seeks to understand how some species are able to live so much longer than others. So without further ado, and I'm very glad to hand over the stage, our Zoom stage at least, to Jeff and the panel to hear everyone's thoughts on these animal secrets. Enjoy this evening. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Becky, and hello, everyone. It's great to have you with us, and I hope you're all managing to stay cool in this hot weather. Uh, before we launch in, I should say I'm sat on a white computer chair in my office. I'm wearing a long sleeve navy T-shirt. I have short hair, a bit of sunburn, and a modest smattering of stubble. If you want to direct any questions to me directly, my pronouns are he, his. Anyway, thank you for having me. I'm very honoured to be hosting this discussion for the Welcome Sanger Institute, who I really first became aware of whilst I was a fledgling zoology student in the early noughties, right after the big publication of the Human Genome Project. And that was such a huge moment, sort of like my generation's moon landing, if you like. And the Sanger, of course, made such a huge contribution to that. And, and since then, throughout my um, sort of science communication career, their name continues to pop up everywhere in the science media landscape with all their exciting various projects. So I'm really looking forward to hearing the latest from the Sanger about the, the Welcome Sanger Institute, about their work on mutation, cancer, and how and why we age, because these are all such important concepts to every one of us, and they're right at the forefront of this sort of research. But what's also really cool about the current era of genomics, to my mind, and about tonight's discussion, in fact, is that human genomes now represent just one tiny part of a giant puzzle, it seems. And to answer some of the fundamental questions about cancer, aging, evolution, even medicine and conservation, there are huge efforts underway to sequence everything, pretty much. And that requires tight collaboration with all sorts of organizations um, to, first of all, get hold of such a diverse range of samples, but also because it requires really technically brilliant people to find ways of storing and archiving these delicate molecular collections and making all that knowledge available to everyone. And we're going to meet some of those intriguing characters tonight as well. So it should be really great. Um, I think actually the reason that I'm here tonight is because back in late 2019, I attended the AAAS meeting in, in Seattle. For anyone that doesn't know, it's a big science meeting. And for scientists, it's great because they get to go and network and hear what everyone else is working on. And as a journalist, it's a great place to go looking for very cool stories. And when I got there, I was very excited. I opened up the, the brochure to see there was this very strong cohort of Sanger scientists on the bill. And uh, I, I recorded loads of stories with them. And one of them ended up on Radio 4 about their one of their big one of their many big projects called the Human Cell Atlas. Um, which sort of aim to map all the cells of the human body and characterize loads of info about how they function, who their cellular neighbors are and how they look in health and disease. And it's this amazing resource for researchers worldwide. Um, and then there were two other stories which I recorded interviews for, but that never really saw the light of day. 
because of the pandemic, I wanted extra interviews and then everything got shut down. And the first was the Earth, a, 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 a project called the Earth Biogenome Project, which aims to sequence every single genome on the planet, possibly excluding the bacteria and archaea. And there's a UK arm of the project called the Darwin Tree of Life Project. And I'm sure we'll hear about it tonight because the Welcome Sanger people are really spearheading that sequencing effort here in the UK. And then the second uh, story that never saw the light of day was um, a story about aging with the researcher at the Welcome Sanger, Alex Kagan, who you're about to meet. And who, as Beth mentioned, works on a program called Cancer, Aging and Somatic Mutation. So it was, in a way, it was sad that those two stories never made it to the radio, but um, I've been reflecting on it and I think perhaps this live event is actually a nicer vehicle for those stories anyway um, because we get to do it face to face in a virtual sense and or we, we might even be able to show you some video and most importantly you the audience can ask questions which never seems to work with the radio um, so I think uh, hopefully Alex should be able to pop up at some point and um, yes he's there and um, Alex I, I wonder then if you can just tell everyone just cast your mind back because i my memory my lasting memory of you in seattle was a really enjoyable discussion we had about why whales were impossible can you explain what you meant by that yeah yeah absolutely so just to begin with yeah hi my name's alex i'm a white male i'm 33 years old wearing a white shirt uh bald with a black beard uh, and yeah i remember that conversation as well and what i was referring to is that you know everything we know about cancer and human suggests that whales shouldn't be able to exist and the reason for that is because we know that cancer uh, in humans, increase, the risk of it increases as we age. And that's because cancer is caused by mutations in our cells. So as we age, DNA damage causes mutations in all the cells in our body. Luckily, most of these are harmless, but occasionally some of them will progress ourselves towards a cancerous state. Uh, and over time, if you have enough of those mutations in a cell, it can become a full on tumor and start dividing uncontrollably. Um, and you know, the, the more cells that you have and the longer you live, the higher the chance of that happening is. Uh, because, you know, the more cells you have, it's like having more lottery tickets and a really bad lottery uh, of getting cancer. Yeah. And so we know in, in humans that, you know, even taller humans have slightly higher risk of cancers like colon cancer because they have more colon and more cells. Oh. But when you when you look across species, that really breaks down. Uh, and there's something called Pito's paradox, which is this observation that larger, longer lived species don't have higher rates of cancer like we'd expect. And actually, if you model it, it should be impossible for a species like a blue whale, which has quadrillion more cells than us, to even reach adulthood without developing cancer. Yeah, just because of that sort of lottery of mutation. If you're a blue whale with quadrillions of cells and you live 90 years, you shouldn't, you sh it shouldn't be possible. Exactly, based on everything we know in humans. And, and that really suggests that some of these animal species must have more effective ways of suppressing cancer than we do as humans. But at the moment, we don't really know what those are. Yeah. So, so Peter's paradox concerns cancers. Um, and as we know, cancers are kicked off by mutation, but uh, the other process that we think is affected by mutation is, is aging, isn't it? And you're, you're particularly interested in that. Yeah. So it's remarkable to me um, when I got into this research to, to learn that even though aging is something that happens to all of us and pretty much all organisms on the planet, we still don't really have a good grasp of what actually causes aging. We know it's probably caused by many different factors, but what exactly those factors are and which ones are maybe the most important, if any, we still don't really have a good hold on. Uh, and as a geneticist, uh, one theory we're really, really interested in is this uh, genetic theory of aging, the somatic theory of, of mutation and aging that suggests that maybe it's this accumulation of mutations over time that contributes to aging. Because you know, we know that mutation can cause cancer, but maybe these mutations over time can also have more subtle effects that make our cells function less well. So if you imagine every cell is kind of like a little dynamic factory in our bodies and the DNA is like the switchboard, all these mutations over time are like flicking little switches and pressing buttons. And you can imagine how over time, if you're flicking a lot of different switches at the control board, the cells might start to function less well. And so we really wanna test that, but at the moment it's just a theory and we haven't really had the data to address the role that mutation plays in aging. I, th I think a few people listening might think, might think, oh, well, I've heard things about telomeres and I've heard different things. So uh, there's a distinction, isn't there? We, we know what aging sort of looks like, don't we? We know quite a few things about that, but we don't necessarily know if mutation is driving it. What does it, what does it look like, first of all? Exactly, yeah. So, so aging, you know, we generally define as a, a gradual decline in the ability of our cells to carry out their function. And then at a larger level, there's a kind of physical and cognitive decline at the organismal level. And there's lots of different traits that we see associated with aging, like the telomeres, which are the, like the little caps at the end of our DNA, 
gets shorter. There's an accumulation of proteins in the cell that aren't effectively being cleared out and a, a whole variety of other processes. But we don't know which of those are a consequence of aging and which are actually causing the aging process. Right. And then you, and you said that, you know, we, we know that we accumulate mutations as we get older and then we die, but we, we're just one species. So we don't know if this is a general principle. So you, 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 you're looking at different species, right? Can you explain the, the rationale behind looking across the animal kingdom? Yeah, absolutely. So we think it's a really good way to address this question of, you know, does mutation play a role in aging? Because if we look across the animal kingdom, we know there's this enormous diversity of lifespans. So, you know, if we're within mammals, you have rodents like mice that live a couple of years. Uh, you have uh, species like the blue whale or the bowhead whale that can live over 100 years or 200 years. Um, and if there is a role of mutation and aging, what we would expect is that species with very short lifespans like mice would be accumulating mutations at a much faster rate. And species that live a lot longer would be accumulating mutations more slowly. That there would be some kind of connection between how long you live and how quickly you're accumulating those mutations. But until now, it's been impossible to collect that data for a number of reasons. Mm. And, and so where do you get your samples from? I imagine mice are easy to come by for someone like you, you know, but that's, you've got this broad range of samples, don't you? Where'd you get them? Yeah, so that's a great question. So it's been traditionally easy to get kind of laboratory model organisms, but they're not the most interesting ones for studying aging because they tend to have quite short lifespans and quite small bodies. Um, but I've been very fortunate at the Welcome Institute Sanger Institute to collaborate with groups. Uh, you'll hear from them tonight, such as uh, ZSL with London Zoo and um, the Cetacean Stranding Investigation Program and others. Um, so we, I work with these groups that are working with different diverse species of animals, um, and they'll perform necropsies when the animals die to try and figure out the, the cause of death. And while they're doing that, they collect a small piece of, of tissue for us. Um, and they're collecting colon tissue for me because we know from humans that actually different cells in our bodies accumulate DNA damage at different rates, which is something we've only learned relatively recently. But, you know, we want to make sure when we're comparing different species that we're comparing the same cell type. And a great thing about colon tissue is that if you, we take this tissue and we cut it into microscopic wafer thin sections, like a, a hundredth of a millimeter thick. And if you look at it under the microscope, you'll see these little pits, they're called colonic crypts, and they line the colon to kind of increase the surface area for absorbing liquid. Uh, and you can, and at the bottom of each of these tiny colonic crypts, again, like a thousandth of a millimeter, there's a few stem cells and they're constantly dividing so that you have this fresh lining of cells in your colon. Uh, and so what we do in the Sanger is we'll use a laser microscope, which is a really cool piece of equipment. It's a microscope with a laser beam attached to it. And we can cut out individual colonic crypts to get all the, there's about a hundred cells in there. And we can take the DNA from each of those cells, sequence it and count the number of mutations that have accumulated in that, those cells since the animal was born. And by doing that across these different species, we've got a uh, tiger, lion, giraffe, a uh, naked mole rat, which is a kind of superstar in the cancer and aging field because it's a, a rodent, but it can live for about 30 years and it has really low rates of cancer. And so by comparing the mutation rates in these different species with diverse lifespans, we can start to look at, well, do these different species accumulate mutations at different rates? And is that related to the, the length at which they're life? Tell us about your results then, about the, the role of mutation in aging across the animal, uh, animals that you looked at. Yeah, so when we got these results, it was really striking to us that we find a really strong inverse correlation between the lifespan of a species and the rate at which it acquires mutations. Uh, so essentially what we find is that if you compare a mouse and a human, a mouse lives about three years, human lives over 80 years. At the end of their life, they have almost the same number of mutations in these cells in their colon, just over 3,000 mutations. And we found that number was very similar across all 16 species of mammal we looked at despite very different lifespans. Uh, mm. So that really suggests you know, that maybe there is this relationship between mutation and aging. Yeah, because if they died with the same number of mutations, but they live so much shorter, they must have a much higher rate of mutation. Exactly, so the kind of the clock in the cell of a mouse for DNA damage is ticking much, much faster than in a human. And the speed at which that clock is going is really calibrated to the length of, of time that, organism, that species is alive, which suggests you know, why would that clock really match the lifespan unless there wasn't some, some role there? Mm. Is that, how do you think about that? Is there just some sort of maximum capacity of mutations that animal cells can deal with before they just buckle? Or... Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. And that's, that's still a mystery to us. We don't know why is it this number? Um, and, you know, how is it causing aging or is it potentially a consequence? But given that DNA itself controls so many of the other processes in a cell, we think there's good reason to believe that it might 
be one of the causative roles in aging. Um, but I think it's going to take more work in the future to really figure out, you know, why this number and, and how is it having an effect on lifespan? Is it stopping the cells working? Is it that, you know, a bit like cancer, you get unhealthy cells that then spread out and colonize the tissue. So that's something for the future. Mm. Well, speaking of cancer, what about Pito's paradox? Does that, I don't suppose your, your results speak to that. What, does mutation rate explain why giant whales are possible? Yes, that's a really interesting point. So although we see this strong correlation with lifespan, when we also look at body size, we don't see the connection there. So if, if lower mutation rates were explaining how species like the blue whale can survive without cancer, we would expect them to have even lower mutation rates to explain the fact not only are they living longer, they have quadrillions more cells. So that suggests that it's actually not the mutation rate that's the solution to low cancer rates in these long-lived species, and then it must be something else. And there's some tantalizing hints from other research that's gone on in the last few years, for example, in elephants. So in humans, we have two copies of this really important gene called TP53, which is kind of like a gatekeeper gene. It makes sure that our cells don't grow too quickly and become cancerous. If they show those signs, it'll shut the cell down. Now in humans, if you both those copies of the gene are broken through mutation, that's a really common first step in developing a cancer. But if you look at elephants and their genome, it turns out they have 20 copies of this gene. So it seems like elephants have kind of got these extra backup copies. So it, it's like in a lottery, you just need to hit, get many more numbers to kind of to, to get the winning ticket. And so, that, that's, that's true across lots of big animals. The blue whales is similar, is it? Well, so we see it in, in elephants, but it's not it doesn't seem like it's the same solution in different species. So that really highlights the value and importance of looking at different animal species, because it seems like potentially each one's found its own solution to kind of suppressing cancer. Hmm. I wonder if just um, for our last couple of minutes, if we can stray into philosophy a little tiny bit, um, because I just wonder if, you know, you know, understanding cancer makes sort of perfect sense. And I wonder is all this effort to understand aging, would that effort be better spent on things like cancer and, and other kinds of illness? I, um, you know, are you, what is are you in the business of, of you know, developing anti-aging creams or what's the driving force behind anti-aging research? Yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. And I wouldn't necessarily say we do anti-aging research. It's more about understanding the aging process. And so we've reached a turning point really in human history in the last couple of years, where there's now more people alive over 60 than under five, which is really testament to our success, you know, in reducing infant mortality through sanitation and medicine. But there's been less attention paid to the diseases that affect us later in life that more of us are now experiencing. Um, and we might not necessarily want to live longer, but I think we'd all like to live healthier lives. And there's this concept of health span. So we hope that by better understanding the aging process and knowing that aging is a, is a major risk factor for a whole plethora of different conditions, that by understanding what causes aging, we can maybe help everyone to live healthier lives, however long those might be. Excellent. Well, I, I'm sorry. Um, we could talk all evening, I'm sure, but we have to just get through everyone. But um, Anyone who's listening to this and who yeah, you know has some burning questions from that conversation with Alex, we are going, Alex will be back at the end. Um, so you should be able to see a little Q and A thing on your Zoom. So just send in a question there, and then we'll have Alex back. Um, thank you very much, Alex. Um, so um, Alex, he mentioned there that you know this work requires a really broad sample of animal materials, and obviously beyond mice, they're very hard to come by. Um, so he has a network of people that he can turn to. And in fact, he teams up with a couple of the people on the panel that we're about to hear from. Um, one of those people is the zoological pathologist, Simon Spiro. And I'm hoping that he's, yes. And hi, Simon's, Jeff. hi, how are you doing? Also, Very well, thank also you. melting like the rest <laughs> of us. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks for, thanks for joining in. Um, let, let's just start then. I, I've sort of got this idea in my head. Um, I'm not sure I'd really contemplated what a, a zoo, you know, zoos pathologist would do, but I've got this idea in my head that your job's like being a medical pathologist, but maybe a hundred times more difficult because of the number of species anatomies you need to know. You must have lots of textbooks. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so just, just to introduce myself to people who are visually impaired, my name's Simon. I'm a 30-something white male. Um, I use pronouns he, him, if you want to send me a message. And yes, and you can't see because I've moved my bookshelves out of the way, but yes, I have lots of books. Um, I have to be familiar with thousands of species from uh, obviously mammals, which are quite similar to humans and uh, very well studied in the veterinary world because of things like dogs and farm animals and cats, then to the more 
a difficult species like the reptiles and fish, where there is one or two textbooks here or there, and also just the the weird and wonderful for which there are no textbooks written yet, like uh, you know starfish. Um, I was doing a, I've got a PM on a millipede to do tomorrow. Uh, I did some a crayfish. PM, earlier a post -mortem. This week. So sorry, a post mortem examination of a millipede tomorrow. Uh, yeah, there, 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 there are no books for some of the things I do, and one day I might even write them. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I mean, you've, you've alluded to a few there. I'm intrigued by the millipede. Have, are there any sort of standout pathological examinations that you've been through that, um, I don't know, shed a bit of light on what you're up against? I think one of the most interesting ones I did was actually in my first week on the job here at ZSL. Um, I'd only ever done one fish post-mortem before arriving. And in my first week, I was presented with um, a, uh, a carcass of an animal called an arapaima, which is a very large fish. They're about 40 kilos and five feet long. Um, and I think I, I sort of knew theoretically how to do a PM, but when presented with this dead fish, I was absolutely scuppered because uh, I think I was always aware that fish scales are made of bone, um, but it was only when I actually tried getting at this fish with my knife, which in the past I've used on, you know, elephants and whales and giraffes and always been able to never really had a problem with I just couldn't get into this fish and I ended up having to use a pair of uh, bolt cutters um, <laughs> instead of scissors to sort of make my incisions and then the fish was just an incredible learning experience for me because the the di my diagnosis in the end for the cause of death of, of a fish my first fish bm uh, was that it had drowned so while we generally think of fish as having gills and being able to extract oxygen from the water Arapaimas are quite special in that as they get older, they start relying more on uh, gulping water, um, gulping air into their swim bladder, which is a sort of buoyancy aid bubble that all fish have um, to help keep them upright. And this fish had sadly gulped water into its swim bladder and uh, turned over and drowned. So uh, my first fish PM, I didn't know what I was doing and uh, the diagnosis was drowning, which most people wouldn't take very seriously if, that's, if you brought that back. No. Wow. And yeah, as you say, no textbooks for that. So you're, I mean, are you sort of Googling the science literature and seeing has anyone written anything about the anatomy of these fish? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I can't use textbooks, but there are a lot of, um, um, there are a lot of papers on the internet. Um, it's a shame I can't uh, go into libraries these days because I love finding old libraries. We've got one at ZSL. There's also some brilliant ones in uh, big universities. And I really like the sort of the, the, the monographs written by Victorian scientists. Because these days, scientific research is, as Alex has been describing, is just so um, fantastical. I mean, completely unimaginable to sort of the, the average person. But in the, in the sort of 1850s, there was a good cottage industry of sort of, you know, vicars and uh, gentlemen scientists who would just go to Brazil and cut open an arapaima and uh, draw extremely beautiful, wood, um, extremely beautiful woodcuts of what they saw. Um, and those, I find those monographs actually some of the most helpful um, this sort of Victorian stamp collecting science where they just uh, wrote down what they saw. That, that, that's what I need. Mm. You must be tempted sometimes to think, well, I must be the first person to have, you know, done this on this fish. I should write a quick paper for any other zoological pathologists out there. Yeah, I've actually, um, I, I was quite keen to, uh, I've, well, I've been keen for a while to start a blog of that exact purpose that would just be pictures, the things that I've, almost tweets there's just the little things i've learned that have taken me months to decipher but i can solve for someone else in a minute like uh fees flying frogs um sometimes get unilateral enlargement of one of their testicles halfway through the year it's not a tumor it's just a thing they do it took me months to work that out and a lot of effort and you could write that in a tweet but it, it is difficult to communicate such things obviously the zoo don't like me putting photos of dead animals on the internet these things should be in an academic context and in papers but i'd love it if people could just the, the things i type into google i, I love to I'd love mm. to think someone else would be uh, would be writing answers well it is it is a sense it's an important but a very sensitive topic i suppose and people get i suppose your colleagues must be, you know have very close bonds with a lot of animals I, w I wonder then you know when an animal dies at the zoo it's sad when any animal dies but what what does that mean to you i suppose practically scientifically emotionally like the whole thing what does it what does it mean um i would like to say that sort of you know we think we treat all the animals equally and i am just as sad when a millipede dies as when an elephant dies but obviously that that isn't the case we do have animals that we we perhaps know personally that have names that have been there for 20 years and we might have personal relationships with 
Um, there's a gibbon called Jimmy that I hear calling uh, every morning when I go into my office. And I, if you've ever walked past Regent's Park, you might have heard him, uh, heard him calling to you. Those sorts of relationships mean that I am obviously sad when, when our animals die and keepers are sad as well. But ZSL takes animal health extremely seriously. And that means that very few of our animals die unexpectedly um, or at young ages. Um, and so often animals will die when they are elderly. Um, after a long period of discussion between the vets, we employ welfare officers, we employ um, specialist keepers who know the animals and we, we come to a decision together when it might be time. Um, and at that point, the post-mortem examination can provide an awful lot of solace to the keepers. Um, it's not only my job to look for diseases we may have missed, but it's also to confirm things that we've already, that we suspected, um, often to feed back on sort of the general condition of an animal, um, to, 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 and to expand our understanding of the species and providing, providing samples for research like Alex's, I think is, is not only something we love to do as scientists, but I think, is, I think the keepers and the people who really know and love the animals really appreciate because uh, it shows that these animals can continue to sort of contribute to the, to the, the survival of their species, the health of their species and you know, human understanding and eventually even human health um, in death. Um, so while it's always a sad event when an animal dies, uh, we are a scientific organization, we're a conservation organization, and anything we can do to further those goals uh, in death as well as in life is, is very much part of our remit. And you mentioned, and Alex did as well, that you know you provided a few of the colon crypts that he needed for his research into aging. Do you have a sprawling network of scientists like that? Do you, when, when a particularly rare make or a, you know some sort of rare mammal dies do you have a bit of an order list where you say that research institution needs a bit of colon they need yes. a bit of heart tissue yeah, yeah i have so many sort of requests um i try and keep track of but i'm also um i sometimes seek out uh researchers so um uh some some of the animals we have we have very large colonies of small animals like bats and just because they because they're small and short-lived and there's we have a lot of them we tend to we do see those relatively often and I wasn't happy with, you know, just the fact that we were, we were doing these PMs, but we weren't really doing much with it. So we, I sought out, basically went on Google and sort of looked around all the London universities to see who uh, researches bats, found a local bat researcher. And we're just uh, submitting a paper now based on uh, those samples that we've been able to take together over the last year. So we, we, I do proactively look for, um, look for collaborators. And uh, if, if anyone listening would like to collaborate and has, uh, has ideas, has, uh, has their own research lab, that want and uh, has everything they need, like a laser dissection microscope, but just doesn't have access to naked mole rats, then uh, that's the sort of uh, collaboration I like. Simon Zuman. Yeah, I, I mean, just, just before we end, and, and again, we will have time to come back to you. You mentioned that, you know, obviously the animals are very well looked after at the ZSL and they often get mm -hmm. to old age. And, you know, do you see parallels between certain animals aging and human aging? I'm, I swear I've seen graying chimpanzees and stuff. I'm not sure if it's the same thing. Oh, absolutely. Um, we have, there's a lot of parallels between an, human aging and animal aging, um, especially in our very well cared for animals. Um, we often see things like arthritis, uh, which you just don't really get in the wild because when animals start to become arthritic and slow down, those are the ones that get caught by the lions um, or don't keep up with the herd and uh, tend to die off. So we, we do get some of these uh, signs of aging uh, that you wouldn't see in the wild. Um, but I think with all veterinary medicine and particularly with zoological medicine, you, you really notice that, there's, that you can become biased by the things you understand. So we diagnose signs like arthritis in these animals because arthritis is so well studied in humans, everyone knows what you're looking for. But I think we really don't understand, I mean, for example, you know, jellyfish aging or, uh, you know, ant aging or all these things. There might be they might have ways that they age that are completely alien to us. And actually, if we understood those, that would tell us an awful lot about, um, an awful lot about how we age ourselves by comparison. I mean, uh, one of the things I always find incredible about aging is, Alex is right talking about uh, all how we accumulate mutations and we die. But of course, all our cells can be traced back to a universal common ancestor, you know, a billion or two billion years ago. And those cells have accumulated, survived, you know, and we, we, we survive by having children. And in that way, we're able to generate a whole new young body from our you know, older selves. 
And some animals like jellyfish, for example, instead of generate those new bodies, but instead of putting it into a, into a, you know, a child, they replace their own organs from these germ cells. So there's, there's incredible ways that animals tackle aging um, mm. that if we could uh, learn and study and understand, could open whole new avenues for ourselves. Mm. Well, yeah, it's all about getting those those animals in the first place. And um, thank you so thank you so much, Simon. Um, again, you. anyone that wants to ask any questions, just put them in the question and answer. Maybe stay there for a second, Simon, um, just in case there's any bad connection with with Rob. But we should we should move on because, as Simon was saying, was you know there's um, a lot we can learn from from an animal once it has passed. But of course, all, not all of the animals that we're interested in, we've heard lots about whales, not, not all of them can fit in a zoo, uh, which brings us nicely on to our next speaker, um, who is Rob DeVille. And he works for the, the CSIP. And I'm not actually sure if, is he there? And can he hear me? And can we hear him? Hello, I can hear you. I'm here. <laughs> okay, excellent. So I got an alarming message about the connection. So that's wonderful news. Um, thank you very much. Do you want to just describe yourself and then we'll have a chat? Yes, yeah, so hi everyone, my name is Rob DeVille. I am a slightly haggard looking white man in my early uh, feet uh, in a rather natty uh, summery top. And uh, if you want to address any questions to me tonight, my pronouns are he and him. Excellent. And um, so could you just, for anyone that hasn't heard of the CSIP, Cetacean Stranding Investigation Project, tell us what it is when it got started. So it began in 1990 and it's uh, being funded by UK government, by DEFRA, Welsh and Scottish governments. Uh, and the schemes in the UK are contracted to investigate strandings around the UK coast. So when cetaceans, which are whales, dolphins and porpoises wash up, we would go and assess them. We record data on every animal and then a portion of animals we recover back to uh, some of facilities around the UK where pathologists like Simon carry out post-mortem examinations, try and establish the cause of death and from that work out more about the threats these species um, face in UK waters. So try to work out how they died and if it was separating the sort of natural causes versus man-made threats. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So we're focusing on the, the man-made, the anthropogenic drivers of mortality. So things like bycatch when they're caught in the fishing gear or when they've been hit by vessels or perhaps they've been impacted by pollution. We separate those from the more natural drivers of mortality where they're attacked and killed by other animals and, and so on. Would uh, I, I'm interested what the sort of species richness of the UK waters really are like. Are we quite a species rich place? And you know, would people be surprised by what washes up on the shores? Yeah, we are absolutely. Um, so there are currently around 90 odd species of cetacean because we're still discovering new species of whale. And I can personally testify that whales do exist to go back to Alex's earlier point. <laughs> and in the UK, we've had 22 species recorded. So that reflects our quite unique position in Northwest Europe. We've got a range of potential habitats from shallow coasts of waters where you get things like harbour porpoises, uh, more deeper pelagic waters where you get things like, like uh, common dolphins and some evading whales, and then very deep continental shelf edge where you get the beaked whales and the deep divers like sperm whales. So all those species are found in and around the UK, which is fantastic. I should also mention that beyond whales and dolphins and porpoises, we also work on, on shark species, on marine turtles, and on uh, uh, pinniped seals as well. And we've had some very exotic uh, shark strand in the UK in the past before, including things like the Greenland shark, which is an amazing looking animal and particularly so it doesn't doesn't I, necessarily belong here normally. So no, it's found in, in some more northern climes. So this one stranded uh, off the coast of Northumberland. It's about three or four meters long and they get to about six or seven, nine, nine meters long in length. And they're very slow moving um, scavenging species normally. So they're found in deeper water. So finding one in the northern North Sea was um, pretty unusual. Um, mm -hmm. And that animal was then covered by ourselves, taken back to the College of Natural History Museum. It, it now farms, forms part of their collection and taking samples from species like that then feeds into research by Alex and others around the UK and, and internationally. What, was that the shark, was that the exact shark that made all the headlines a few months ago about being, you know, hundreds of years old and alive during the reign of yep. Henry yep, VIII so or one, something? That's right. So one animal was allegedly aged to over 400 years old, which is quite extraordinary. Um, I know uh, that some cetaceans can also live not quite as long, but long lives too. So there's a species of an Arctic whale called the bowhead whale. But we have had one in the UK waters before in the past. And one animal is aged to over 220. So again, the, these animals can live for a long, long time. This feeds into the research we'll be talking about tonight with Alex. Mm. 
I wonder if I, I'd quite like to pose the same sort of question that I asked Simon to you, actually. Like, wh- how do you feel when a, about, an, about an animal um, washing up dead on the shore? You know, presumably a great source of information, but, but you know, sad. There, yeah, I mean, there are, obviously there are sad events. I mean, perhaps some context might be useful as well. I mean, every year around the UK, we get around a thousand cetacean strandings. And we right. have a lot of coastline, lots of wiggly bits, including around northwest Scotland. So lots of room for animals to strand. Uh, we've had strandings throughout recorded history. Um, so yes, it is a sad event, but you, essentially we're not trying to stop strandings. That's a common misconception. We're trying to learn more about the man, ones that have a man-made driver and actually trying to, to mitigate the impact of those man-made threats. And in fact, in a weird way, it's animals where we don't see them strand. We have much more cause for concern from a conservation perspective because it might indicate there are far fewer or none left in waters where they used to be. So we get a stranding event you know, supported to us, we recover the body, bring it back. And yes, it is a sad event, but we try and collect as much as possible for prospective research because these animals are really hard to study in the wild. Um, some species of whale we only know about from stranding events. And as I say, we're still discovering new species of whale, animals wash up that have never been described before. And I think that just reflects the, the unknown mystery of what's further out there that we're still trying to discover. Mm. And and you said there have been some cool, unique examples. But have you seen, you know, over your years doing it, any uh, trends? I mean, you mentioned the Greenland shark. You said normally it's in more northern climes. Um, are you seeing broad trends with a sort of warming ocean, for instance? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have um, a long time series, 30 years. We've got this north-south distribution in the UK, an 800-mile transect. And we can see changes in distribution over time. We had a paper published a few weeks ago looking at shifts in distribution for some of these species. So, for example, uh, warm water species like common dolphins and striped dolphins are now being found further, far further north than they used to be found in Scottish waters now. And we've seen a range contraction at the same time of the colder water species, things like white big dolphins and white sided dolphins. So, certainly, there's evidence in the UK from our program that there's certainly a response to climate change driven impacts. Mm. And, and just logistically, it sounds like it must be really difficult. Someone like Simon, you know, he's got to deal with his millipede tomorrow and he'll probably bring it and put it on a nice table and put the light on. You presumably, presumably they, all these animals don't just go somewhere nice and convenient with a, with road access. And, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it's, it must be a different challenge every time your buzzer goes. It is, and they are. And I don't know, maybe this is the time to do it, but we, we did have a video that we put together ah. on. Or maybe we could end on that give people a <laughs> give people a flavor of it yeah so uh when when possible if we could put the video on um and i'll, and I'll talk through it, it illustrates the point exactly you're trying to make there that some of these stranding events are really hard to get to so hopefully this will play in the background and we'll talk it through so if people can see this um this is um, some drone footage that we shot at various strandings there's a variety of different strandings here the first one is a sperm whale from the Northumberland coast. Uh, I think the second one shows a fin whale in Flintshire on the west coast of the UK, a fin whale in Cornwall, where I am at the moment, in a hot hotel room. And uh, another one that's at the end is a killer whale found in the wash. So as the camera pans around, you can see, well, first of all, the size of these animals, how extraordinarily big they are. That's an obvious point, but also how difficult they can be to access and to examine. Um, they can be really complex events and Pragmatically, the problem, of course, is that they go off fairly quickly. So the blubber layer keeps them nice and warm when they're alive. Um, it also keeps them nice and warm when they're dead. And I can testify that it can be quite an unpleasant and lengthy experience. So we need to try and get these animals as quickly as we can. I think the last um, video, although this one actually shows the, a fin well in Cornwall, where I am at the moment, we examined this one during a blowing storm coming in from the southwest coast. So the volunteers and uh, our pathologist James Barnett were trying to do as much as they can before the tide came in and restricted their access and trying to do what they can in this uh, really difficult and dramatic conditions. And I think the last one uh, video might show a killer whale in the wash. This is a really interesting case. It was pretty decomposed um, and people might ask why we're going to animal that runny. But um, killer whales are really priority species for us. They're stranded in the wash on an RAF bombing range. It can only be accessed when they weren't doing bombing runs at high tide, at low tide, sorry. So it's once in every two weeks we can get to the body. So 
extraordinary efforts across the marshes, which you can see uh, with these uh, large rivulets running across the area, just to get to the animal and try and collect as much useful information and data as we could, because even when they decompose, they can still tell you an awful lot. Mm, so never a dull day at the CSIP, it sounds. And similar similar to Simon, it sounds like you also have a, a sometimes an order list, collaborative uh, collaborations with other institutions where you collect samples um, for science and for different people. Um, right. Well, that was that. Thank you very much for that, Rob. Um, finally, I think we have one more panelist now. And remember, this is the and then we've got ten minutes of discussion now, and then we're going to go straight to the live Q and A. So you can send in your questions at any time. Um, so. Ah uh, yes, and our final final speaker is uh, uh, Jacqueline Mackenzie Dodds, and it's sort of a nice bit of circularity because um, she is involved in DNA. So we've kind of come full circle from Alex um, around the samples and back to DNA again. Um, and obviously DNA, which if you want to keep it in good nick, uh, needs to be stored at really cold temperatures. So who better to talk to than than uh, liquid nitrogen lady? I think I heard you call yourself Jackie. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I, I, I'm Jackie McKenzie Dodds. I'm a um, uh, uh, female, late fifties, terrible lockdown hair at the moment, and green teeth after not having go to the, not having gone to the dentist or the hairdresser <laughs> for months. Apologies for that. <laughs> yeah, and I was introduced already, so everybody knows that I work at the Natural History Museum and and um, look after the biobank there, which has liquid nitrogen. Exactly. Would you tell us, uh, paint a little picture of of your working environment for us? Because I'm not sure that most people will know that there's. Is it like a labyrinth of freezers underneath the Natural History yeah, Museum? Yeah, the biobanks are, are always like that. Actually, they're they're kind of put in the basement, the dingy, dark basements, and they're just rows of freezers and and quite sort of boring looking places. But mine is very pretty and quite brightly lit. It's in the basement. Um, it has all sorts of freezers at different temperatures uh, uh, from minus 20, minus 80 to liquid nitrogen at minus 196 degrees, which is wow. super, super cold. Mm. And all of the freezers have names. So they are all named after things that live in cold places. So we've got polar bear and Arctic fox and reindeer. We've got uh. as well. And we've got lion's mane jellyfish. We've got invertebrates. We've got plants. I was sort um, of hoping that they'd be labelled <laughs> aardvark to zebra just actually yeah it sounds a bit more fun i think my my database is <laughs> right so you mentioned the liquid nitrogen uh, minus 192 did you say that actually sounds quite dangerous to work in that environment is it 196 degrees liquid nitrogen that, you, that's the temperature that that liquid nitrogen um is at and yes that's extremely cold and it just just for a comparison um, anybody who did physics would would know about absolute zero. That's minus 273, 273 degrees C. That's when all the molecules stop moving and it's the sort of hypothetical absolute temperature that things are just as cold as they can possibly be. So minus 196 that we store samples in at the at the at the at the Natural History Museum is yeah, it's still a far, far, you know, a little way off that, but it's pretty cold. Yeah, and and you said, or I read somewhere that it, the the biobank at the NHM started in 2012 or, or something. What was the impetus for that? Because when I think of London Natural History Museum, I think Diplodocus, lots yeah. of hard, dusty, old, stuffy morphological stuff. What what was this shift about? It was very new, yes, because the Natural History Museum traditionally has got all of the things that we know and love, the big specimens, the, the um, you know, the, the, the galleries, of course, but behind the scenes, it's it's got the fossils and the, and the skins and the bones and the pickled things in jars. And, um, you know, we know mm. those too. So moving to a, um, a frozen collection was, was something a bit different. And that, that kind of started really when molecular biology kicked off in, in you know, the mid 80s, when people were doing molecular projects and generating lots of products and um, doing their projects and, you know, molecular biology came to the museum and the researchers there were generating a lot of uh, samples and data 
but um, the samples were starting to burst at the seams. So by the time we, I started, and then um, round about in the 1990s, um, it, there was a need really to centralise this and, and capture all them and you know, get the material kind of sorted and audited so that other researchers could use it. Um, and um, so, you know, to, to put all of this, which was frozen material into a centralised facility, we needed to look at, at biobanking it really, like along the lines that the, the medical biobanks were doing. So that the biodiversity world, which, um, you know, not as well funded and all of those things, had to kind of aspire to what the human biobanks were doing for, you know, blood banks and sperm banks and you know, how, they, how they sorted and organised their material and made it discoverable and accessible to researchers mm. is kind of you know what, what we did um mm. and are still doing and and how do you respond you must you must hear people saying you know that all that effort to freeze samples and sort of create this archive for the future again it's maybe maybe more traditional forms of conservation or the effort should be going there you know so that we don't need to store in some futuristic um you know fridge yeah. archive where have you respond well, to that well it is, there's lots of different strands here and really important and um, we've got the legacy collections which have been created you know by the researchers still got some very valuable material and, and remember that some of these some of this material has been collected from species which are endangered or maybe even extinct in the wild now. So, you know, that, that material needs to be kind of safeguarded really for the future. Um, but also we've got sampling initiatives looking at, at uh, gaps that we have. We can't represent the whole tree of life in our biobank, but we can certainly make some attempt to go and um, rescue the, the genetic resources that are out there and, and that are at risk in, in the wild and, you know, put them into a biobank that is going to store things in liquid nitrogen because you've got, you know, you, you clobbered the, the, the molecular movement. So you're going to clobber the degradation, uh, keep it pristine forever. Um, it's a place to, to put those genetic resources. So people can use them um, in the future, um, but it's not everything. You know, there's no point in having these things if you, if you haven't got a parallel um, conservation effort happening at the same time. So our material has the genetic resources. It can, it can, we can pull the samples out and give them to people like Alex and Simon to look at um, anti-aging genes and uh, you know cancer-resistant genes. But uh, there's all sorts of other things in there. There's a whole story in those genetic resources which can inform conservation, and that's applied conservation. But the Natural History Museum doesn't, it, it, it doesn't do that. It just looks after the resources. It's a steward. It, the yeah. nation's collections, and we're looking after this, these resources for, you know, all the other people to, to use. And not just us at the moment, but for future generations too. So we want to get it, get it snap frozen and, and put it away. But you really need the conservation um, in parallel as well. And the two things help each other because... Yeah. You, you can you can pull the, the genetic resources out of the biobank and um, look mm -hmm. at it can inform you know uh, look at the different species monitor the ecosystems um, think about how you manage the, the species in the ecosystems um, that that's somebody else's job not mine but sure, you know the two sure. things have to happen sure so do you do you ever have you know they sounds like quite a finite resource uh, you probably you presumably don't have an infinite capacity of space in the first place and also some of the samples that you do have might be from very rare or even indeed extinct organisms do you as the as the arbiter um as the steward sorry of that collection have difficult choices to make when you get an email saying we need a bit of some very rare damselflies cells and actually yeah. you're like well we're quite low on that and we're not sure that your research project is important enough yeah well you see I, you know I, I, I sort of i spanned the researcher curator culture clash and that's when i become a curator and and i want to say <laughs> I, I would never use up the last little bit in my tube of whatever hmm. well they, they, i would but there'd have to be a really good reason for it I mean, the, the material is um, there to be used and destructively sampled, but um, some of the rare stuff, 
um, yeah, it's, it's extremely precious. Um, and, and so as a manager, I would be looking at people's, people's you know, requests to use it. Um, I'd be looking at um, where it's put in, in, in the biobank. You know, it would have to be like a priority sample. So mm. if the power cut, it would be the first thing that would get rescued, mm. that kind of thing. Um, if, if, if we had the opportunity to get more of it, I would make more space for it if it was endangered. Mm. Yeah. There's, there's a sort of value here um, to do with storage and, and people's requests to use it. They mm. have to really convince me if they want me to give it to them. <laughs> yeah. And we don't have long left before the Q&A when people can ask you as many questions as they want. But is, is there a, before we finish, is there a, is it, is it a purely kind of hard copy archive or is there a digital element to your millions of samples? Well, the, the tissue is the most important thing. So that's the physical sample. And actually, um, the, the, it contains the whole story and it's beginning to get to the point where the sequencing, we're in a you know, genome sequencing revolution that going back to the physical samples and, and especially in a museum context where those physical samples are vouchered. So they've got to, you know, the whole animal, they're not just, you know, that they've got, they've got all the metadata connected to that. Um, the, the physical it is physical but um the 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 data is absolutely paramount as well and we've got a huge you can imagine the museum being the museum got a huge collections management system and a database and all the information from our samples is popped out on the data portal so you can search for what we have and find out all of the, the other information about it. Now, not all of it is digitized yet. It's, we've got 80 million specimens in the museum and you know only a part of them are molecular, but it's gradually getting there so that everybody around the world can go into the data portal and see what we, mm. and that will translate and come through to me and the physical samples in my biobank. Yeah. And then very quickly, finally, I wonder if you, I sort of imagine if I were in there with you and you'd explained what this was, that there might be quite an emotional experience just knowing how much, you know, giga, gigabytes of, of just information that you're surrounded by. And, and that might be, that might hold interesting evolutionary stories. It might hold the next antibiotic or the next cancer drug. It's, it must be quite a profound place to yeah. kind of just contemplate yeah absolutely and i think that's that's one of those things that a lot of people at the natural history museum feel all about their collections um but i mean especially in a molecular world the things that uh, that we hold in the liquid nitrogen vessels that, that have got all of that information i mean including um cell lines these days and all of the viable it's a post-genomic kind of information so you know it gives you goose pimples thinking how much information you can unlock from these tiny little bits of tissue. Um, the things that, that Rob collects, put into a tube, put into liquid nitrogen, you know, really kind of quickly before it degrades, what we can unlock from that, um, not just DNA, beyond DNA for, for the future. So yeah, it's a huge responsibility and we're only a snapshot in time. Um, I'm just looking after it really for the future generations. It's, it's there forever. Hmm. For the you know the next generation of scientists to dig out those those molecular things they want to find yeah we don't know what we don't know yet no. but it's, all, it's all very exciting <laughs> and we well, have to keep all the options open we this is sad sounds like a sad fact of the reality um that's a um uh well a little bit bleak a little bit exciting um place to end i think this chat because and i think if you stay there jackie and possibly it's time for everyone to come back maybe leave your microphones off uh and unless you want to and i'll post some questions we've had lots of questions which is great um so we'll have rob's back simon's back excellent and um i think i was told as is customary for these things that we'll, we'll start with a student question and um there's actually been two questions from year sevens. And so I'll just, uh, they're great questions. I'll just, they're quite similar. So I'll, I'll post, pose them both to you and, and anyone can just jump in. And they are, has any cell ever left you in shock? 
And and the second question was, what is the most unique cell you've looked at? And I wonder if, you know, that might be the one that also shocked you. So I thought I'd throw both of those questions at you at the same time. I can answer the cell that has shocked me. Um, so I'm a, I'm a pathologist, which means I don't only look at, uh, when people think of postmortems, they think of you there with a body on your table, but I also use a microscope and look at individual cells. And uh, one of the things we see in cancer is, um, as Alex said, cancer cells are mutated, and that means they can start to look weird. And you may have learned about mitosis, which is when cells divide in two and make new cells. It's a time where they pick up a lot of mutations. And it's a thing they do a lot of in, in cancer, cancerous cells doing too much mitosis. And I get very excited because every now and again, I'll see in a tumor, a cell which isn't dividing into two cells, but it's dividing into three cells. It's kind of the four leafed clover of the cancer world. You see these things, they've gone so wrong. They don't even know how to divide properly. And uh, the first time I saw that, I mean, I, I knew to expect it. So I wouldn't say it was a shock, but it, it's always exciting. And I always get my camera out and take a picture because I, I love these little three leaf three-way cells. Excellent. Um, anyone else for cells or should we move on to a different question? Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, we had another question here. Uh, I'm not sure if we're doing names, but we've had another question, which was, can aging and the rate of mutation be affected by the environment? Uh, would the mutation and the organization of genes be affected because of what the animal or human is exposed to? Yeah, so I think that's a, a fantastic question, and that's absolutely something that uh, we want to look at. We know from humans that absolutely different environmental effects, you know, like smoking or exposure to certain chemicals, does leave a trace in the DNA. And what's fascinating, actually, is that it's, you can almost take an archaeological approach. You can look at DNA damage and then figure out from the different patterns of DNA damage from different chemicals what chemical originally caused that damage from environmental exposure. And so that's been applied to understanding the causes of different cancers in humans. But a real dream that we have is that one day with the new genome resources becoming available from the Darwin Tree of Life project and, and samples um, provided by other people here and beyond, is that you could actually do a kind of monitoring of wild species in the wild, looking at their DNA and understanding, are they being uh, suffering the damage caused by different environmental mutagens? So a way to really better link uh, kind of anthropogenic chemical influences on ecosystem health. Because at the moment now, if you know, animals seem to be having shorter lifespans, it can be tricky to find out what's the ex exact cause. But if you can take some of their DNA and figure out, right, this exact chemical has left this signature, it's like a smoking gun. And then we can really better understand what different environmental exposures are influencing animal health. And I think that will lead to much more accountability of the causes of that pollution and just give us a much higher resolution understanding of mm. what's you know, affecting different animal species. And it just reminds me actually of an earlier uh, conversation I've had with you is that was another one of the reasons for using colon crypts, wasn't it? That as opposed to maybe like a skin cell was that perhaps skin cells might have mutations from environmental factors, but colon sort of nice and snug and presumably secure. Exactly. So if you look at a, a skin sample from a, from a human, maybe not from a, a furred animal, but from with our exposed skin, you find the, it, the number of mutations are just dwarfed by UV damage that's, that's damaging the DNA. But in the colon, it seems that the processes of mutation there, we understand from kind of looking at the human body as a whole, are these kind of endogenous processes that are just the cell going along its, its business and getting damaged because the cell's a busy dynamic place, but less influence from, from outside sources. Excellent. Well, thank you, Alex. Um, if, if no one else has anything to add on to that, there's a, a great question here. Is it possible to insert a section of a bowhead whale genome into a human? Would it be possible for humans to live longer? So it's two questions, actually. That's cheeky. But uh, I think the first one, would it be possible to insert a section, didn't specify how long, of a bowhead whale genome into a human? Yeah, so that's a it's a great question. It's, it sounds fantastical, but actually there are groups, uh, not at the Sanger, but around the world that are exploring, you know, I mentioned with elephants having more copies of this uh, cancer suppressor gene, TP53, mm. there are groups doing experiments with, with human cell lines, so just cells grown in a dish. You can use with these new genomic technologies, they can insert extra copies of TP53, and they're seeing if that could actually lead to, to cells living longer. Uh, and there's also this famous organism called a tardigrad, which is this you know, microscopic organism that can live it out in space. It seems to be able to resist cosmic rays. And there are also groups trying to figure out if you can find out what are the genes there that enable them to, to do that? And can you also put them into human cells? I'd say we're, we're a long way off from this ever being something that would be used, but it's those first stages of trying to understand, you know, are there ways that you could 
increase human cell life through what we learn from other species. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so a lot of these questions seem to be just naturally leading to you, Alex. Uh, there was a, another great question, which was, do biobanks trade samples with other countries' biobanks? Sort of like football stickers. Yeah, they do. That's our business. And we love it and we want more of it. So, you know, um, you, you can't be a biobank really on your own. It's uh, especially when you're you're involved in tree of life type stuff. We're trying to, you know, um, link up with all the rest, represent all the rest of the, the species across the tree of life um, and connect up with our partners so that we're all we're doing the job looking at the ecosystem uh, as a whole. So, yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. We will. We'll trade with everybody. <laughs> and uh, there's another question, possibly going to go straight back to you, Alex, uh, but we'll see if anyone else wants to jump in. It's, do, do you analyse the genomes of organisms that have been fossilised in ice, such as mammoths? That's, yeah, that's a great question. So fossilised, we, we can't really look at when the, when, the, you know, when the bones turn to stone, but encased in ice, which is slightly different to fossilised, it's kind of preserved, a bit like in Jackie's freezers but over geological time. Uh, we don't look at that, but absolutely other groups do. So, and woolly mammoths have been looked at in this context of aging, because woolly mammoths are even bigger than African elephants. And actually, if you look at their genomes, you find they have even more copies of these tumor suppressor genes. So that really fits this idea that bigger species um, mm. are kind of getting more copies of these important genes. And Jackie, do, do you, is there a policy on, because um, you, you know, you mentioned that you might have samples in your, biobank which are from species which already exist extinct sorry do you have a time limit uh, would you have do you have woolly mammoth samples in your uh, molecular biobank uh, we we have an ancient dna uh, facility as well at the natural history museum and, and actually that's where those sorts of samples would probably go first um because they've got the, the technology to be able to well i, I might store them but um um, the, the products from the research would, would eventually come to me, but um, that, that's ancient DNA, that's the ancient DNA part of the, the Natural History Museum. I, do, I don't have anything really exciting like that at the moment, you know, not, not from those things yet. Okay, well someone, <laughs> someone was uh, inspired enough by that answer that they wanted to follow up with, what's the coolest sample, and I presume they mean awesome, uh, that you've stored in the biobank at the Natural History Museum? The coolest. Oh my God. But I love all my samples. <laughs> well, you have to choose one and, and we're live on Zoom. <laughs> Give me a few minutes. I'll come back. Uh, okay. Well, why don't, why don't we go to Rob? Why don't we go... <laughs> I want to, I actually want to throw that to Rob whilst you're thinking of that. Um, and just what is the, what's the coolest? I mean, you mentioned that Greenland shark. That sounds, that sounds pretty cool. But first of all, either what's the coolest thing that you've seen over the years, or is there something on your kind of watch list that you're thinking, oh, that, that might be in these warming seas, we might see that. Well, I mean, there's currently an errant walrus hanging around off the coast of Cornwall, but you hope he gets to escape and get away. Um... Where, where, where should he be? Not, not around the coast of Cornwall, let's put it that way. I mean, it is an interesting point. We are seeing more and more errant species around the UK. We've had the bowhead whale off the coast of Cornwall, Wally the walrus currently in Aberdeen off the Scillies. We've had uh, belugas in the, in the Thames estuary. So it's all part of the picture of a changing world that unfortunately we're all facing. Um, coolest. I suppose most another way to look at that is maybe the most important samples we collect. We've collected samples on a range of really vulnerable species, which are sadly facing quite significant conservation threats. So I talked about the killer whale earlier on, when we can collect the blubber sample from killer whales, and this may also link into research that Alex is interested in, we detect very high levels of uh, organic contaminants within those samples. Man-made compounds that we produce end up in the environment and end up in really significant levels in killer whales. And so collecting that data, those samples are really vital because that's the only way we're going to learn more about the threats that these species face. But I'll also mm. put Jacqueline's, um, Jackie's answer to every sample is important. Yeah. And um, just to follow up on that, and then we'll come back to Jacqueline, uh, because we, I, I wanted to ask you this in the first bit, but we ran out of time. That is, you know, you, you get all these samples and you've been doing it for such a long time. Uh, do your, what impact does, does the work of the CSIP have on sort of 
policy nationally here in the UK? And does it, you know, go to, do you have international networks that affect, I don't know, whaling treaties and stuff like that? What impact does the work have on policy? Um, hopefully you can hear me because my internet's really shonky in my oh, hotel We can room. hear you fine. Um, okay, cool. Um, yeah, it definitely has a real world policy impact. Um, the data we collect is not just for, um, for scientific research, although that's an important part of it. It feeds into efforts to mitigate these threats uh, in the UK and internationally. So one example, uh, we detected a particular form of brominated flame retardant, which stops us over catching fire. You know, they put this stuff in there in the 70s. So it stops them burning when you fall asleep with a cigarette going on. And unfortunately, we found levels of these flame retardants in the marine environment and in our harbour porpoises. And that fed into an EU-wide risk assessment. There was a ban on that contaminant. And then post that ban, we did some monitoring and uh, investigation of porpoises after the ban. And we can see a decline over time. So there's a nice circularity there. We detect a problem. There's a policy change. We can detect the, the, the response to that change too. So it definitely has a real world um, impact as well. Excellent. That must be very gratifying. Um, <laughs> we've had another great question. I think this was presumably, uh, oh, I suppose it could be aimed at Simon or Rob. Do postmortems smell really bad? And what was the nastiest sample that you have to look, you've had to look at? <laughs> uh, I, we can't hear you, Simon. Sorry, they, they can smell bad, um, but not always. If um, I'm lucky sort of being full time employed by the zoo means that I am on hand as soon as an animal dies or as soon as an animal is euthanized, I'm in there doing the postmortem and it's identical to surgery. I mean, nothing has changed. Um, and that's that's when we get the best samples. Everything is completely fresh. That's the sort of thing which feeds into Alex's work. Um, but it can certainly, the more you wait, the, the, the worse it gets. I, I used to do um, work for the RSPCA, so more forensic postmortems. I remember in a heat wave similar to this one, I would do you know animals that had perhaps been found dead after a while, um, and we had a um, I, I had a, an abbreviation I would use in the notes, which was uh, MMTC, which is more maggot than carcass. And that <laughs> was usually the I usually leave them there, but uh, if you want to hear about horrible carcasses, Rob Rob's your man for that because you you're definitely not there as soon as they cark it. Horrible yeah. carcasses, Rob. Um, yeah, well, as Simon also knows, uh, unfortunately, the nature of the material that we get, things that wash up on the coast, you have to take what you can get. And I think, as I alluded to earlier, um, some whales have a habit of exploding. There's a great subgenre of the internet out there called Exploding Whales. So people go out there and Google that if you want to know. And I can testify from personal experience, they do, do burst on you and it is fragrant. But it, it, is, it is what it is, you know. That's what yeah. you have to go through to try and learn more. Which reminds me, I'm a little bit mortified that I didn't give a, um, a, this maybe distressing warning before the, the uh, whale video. But definitely, if you're going to go Googling exploding whales, um, that may well be distressing. So I've said it. Um, I forgot to come back to you, Jackie. Um, did you decide what the coolest thing you had in your freezers were, was? Oh, it's such an unfair question, but I, 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 you're forcing me. So that there is one sample I have of... Um, um, giant squid, a piece of giant squid, and, and and if anybody has come to the museum and done the behind the scenes tours, and you go into the tank room, which you must do if, if you haven't before, there's the giant squid is like the centerpiece, and uh, we do have um, a fresh, nice bit of that in my freezers. Uh, mm. Really cool creature. Mm. You can see the, the whole the whole specimen is not as big as it would have got. You'll have to ask the, the, the proper curators mm. uh, um, to, to tell you the whole story, but it, it's it's ginormous um, mm. and, it, and it would have got even bigger. And these creatures are out there and this washed up in the Falklands um, several years ago. So that that's, I suppose, the coolest. But, but actually, we have hundreds of samples of really rare and endangered animals in the freezers that are... Um, you know they've been they've been collected over the, over the decades and frogs and birds and a, a lot of herps actually a lot of a lot of birds really interesting stuff over the years which is I mean just such a um, you know a, 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 a responsibility and a joy to have and you know some of these things are just disappearing from from the environment and one day they just it might be the last place that they actually exist is in in our in our biobank so. Um, 
those are cool. <laughs> they really are cool. You made me think of a sort of uh, silly curiosity question, but might lead to some interesting biology, which is, uh, is your giant squid sample in your biobank any bigger than your uh, mosquito sample? Uh, big animals, do you get bigger samples? And that can, uh, everyone, well, everyone can answer that as well after you, Jackie. Yeah, um, well, the, the, our biobank, it sort of tries to be like a modern, you know, clinical biobank. So the smaller, the better. It's all about cost per sample. So you want to be able to get this stuff into a small cryo vial. Um, but you do want to get as much tissue as possible. Uh, so I do have, uh, I don't know, uh, the size of a lentil of the of the giant squid, uh, whereas, you know, a, a mosquito will just be a mosquito size. So, yeah, there's considerably more tissue there. It does vary. Um, right. But still, that's surprising to me. It's the size of a lentil. That's all you keep from a giant sea squid. You can get a lot of information. Alex will tell you. You can get a lot of information from that size. You don't, we, as technology gets, gets bigger and better and, um, you know, cheaper, you can get even more information from smaller samples, which is great because it means we can pack more genetic resources and samples and, and specimens into the biobank and um, we don't have to have huge quantities to get tiny amounts of information anymore it's 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 wonderful mm. simon rob when you if someone's asked you for some sort of whale cardiac tissue some heart tissue do you take a bigger bit than you would if it was a little sh small shark off to you simon oh well i just say yeah um no, you can usually, uh, these things, these organs are limited. The biology of an organism is limited by the cells and cells are pretty much the same size, whether it's a mouse or an elephant. Um, so what you see down the microscope can be quite interesting. So for example, um, the kidney, um, your kidney is made up of thousands of individual units called nephrons. Um, and sometimes I look at really, really tiny fish. So maybe just, you know, less than a centimeter long. And what amazes me is, of course, they don't have smaller cells. They don't pack more nephrons into the same size. Whereas you've got maybe 10,000. I look at fish sometimes that have three. And of course, they just have less water to filter because they're that, that tiny. So um, generally, a small bit of tissue is just as good as a big bit. The only place where this isn't true is the one organ which is so complicated that you need every little bit of it is uh, brains. And so our basement, whereas Jackie has uh, tens of thousands of tiny little tubes filled with cells, we have a basement with massive buckets uh, filled with brains from all the different species we collect because that just there's no bit of the brain that isn't important. There's no I, I can't just take a tiny little sample here and say, well, that's representative. And so that's where it right. gets really uh, that's where the formal in bill really shoots up. Wow. Do you ever go down there alone, Simon? Um, absolutely. But I usually tell someone I'm going down there. Um, whereas Jackie's basement is new and exciting and interesting, R1 floods regularly, um, has doors which are only four feet high in some cases, um, <laughs> has a lot of pipes at head height. It's it's a dangerous place, and that's before you take into account the thousands of litres of uh, formalin. Wow, excellent. Sounds dreamy. Um, anyone else, or shall we look for another question? There was another one directed straight, the, straight at you, Simon, which was just... Do most do most of your samples die of old age, or do they die of other causes? It's it's a funny thing. I I don't think of dying of old age as being a thing. You have to die of something, and there are things that become more and more common as you get old, like heart failure. Like in humans, Alzheimer's disease is actually one of the leading. We don't we think of Alzheimer's disease as something you suffer from, but it's actually one of the leading causes of death in the UK. Um, so. I, I always think dying of old age is a bit of a cop out. That sort of means I know this animal is dead, but I don't know why. So I always try to get a bit more specific than that. And of course, if we're going to fight diseases of aging, we need that level of granularity. We need to be able to say we're not. So I think one of the morbid things I say sometimes is, uh, you know, I notice that, uh, that sometimes newspapers will write articles about how cases of heart disease, uh, heart disease and cancer are soaring in the UK. And I look at that and think, well, that's rather good because it means people aren't dying of measles and polio or being hit by cars or all those things that can happen of any age they're, they're dying of things that happen when you get very old mm. so uh, I, I i do sometimes use the term old age but I, I do try and avoid it and rob um when uh, do you see whales arriving on the shores that you believe have died of old age i, I suppose do 
do dead animal do, do whales die of old age and then wash up on a shore or is the act of coming up on the shore what kills most animals um sorry that was two questions so there wasn't it of the thousand or so strandings i meant sorry so of the thousand so strandings i mentioned earlier the vast majority are, are dead strandings animals that die at sea and then wash up the prevailing winds we, we do get some live strandings and in this live stranding yeah we might have a bit of a bad so connection uh, Rob, I think we might have Some a bit of a bad connection. Animals, so. Yeah, my, my internet. <laughs> That's okay. I might come back yeah. to you with that. We've, we've got sort of five more minutes to, to chat. Over to somebody else. Okay. That's no problem. That's no problem. If anything, this is a good time for your internet sniff to fail because we've, you know, we've got through the, the vast bulk of it. So, um, okay. Here's a nice long question uh, directed to Alex. Do you think the differences in the pace of mutation accumulation and lifespan between species are driven by differences at the DNA damage repair level or in pruning of senescent cells? Uh, that's the first half. Do you want, do you want to go for that, Alex? Yeah, well, it's, um, I think that's a fantastic question and it's something we don't really at all have the answer to yet. We're just beginning this kind of field of research of actually being able to look at these mutations with age across different species. Uh, and so, yeah, in the, in the coming years, we're definitely gonna try and answer those questions. Um, at the moment, we, we can't answer them. And, and it's still a, also a, a big question for within humans as well, what's actually causing these processes of aging? And you know, is it to do with the rate that cells divide, uh, the metabolism of different cells? And, and there's surprisingly little data, I think, just on you know, cellular measurements in different species. And so hopefully over time, you know, and as, and as genomic resources improve, we'll be able to just address these questions in a much wider range of species. Okay. And then the second half of that question is, I'm not sure I get it. It was, do you know anything about the light, the lifespan slash metabolic rate of individual cells from different species? So do whale colon cells live longer than mouse cells, presumably mouse colon cells? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know if, if Simon or Rob have anything to say about that, but from our perspective, no, there's, there's shockingly little known about some of the basic cellular biology of different species. And so I think it's just incredibly valuable, the resources of an NHM and the other samples that, that people here are collecting, because these are questions that we need to answer to get a complete understanding of you know, health and aging. Uh, and at the moment, we just don't know the answers. Hmm. Uh, if you were to give someone you love a sample for their birthday present, which one would you choose and why? I guess that's for everyone. As I'm unmuted, I'll go first. Um, actually, I think any of the samples, actually, I was, I'm surprised when I started working in this field, how beautiful uh, histological sections look. So you stain the sections so you can see them under a microscope with uh, these um, different chemicals called hematoxylin and eosin. I think one of them is derived from like a wood bark and it gives them these bright pinks and purples. So actually they almost look like stained glass when you have light shining through them. So I think any kind of histological section actually looks surprisingly beautiful. Okay. Um, so we've still got a few more minutes. Um, if anyone else wants to answer that question or we'll find another one. Um, we have one here. Are there any others working in related fields that you're looking to collaborate with, for instance, that might give access to more species or help understand environmental factors more? Uh, yeah, I, I would say that we're, absolutely. We're, so we're just beginning this research. We've looked at mammals, but now we want to look uh, more broadly at other species because there's a great range of, of lifespans in mammals, but it's even more extraordinary when you go beyond, you know, look, look at trees living for, you know, many centuries, um, and particularly for looking at the environmental effects on mutation. There's so many cases around the world of animals and species that seem to be affected by human induced kind of pollution. Um, so I think there's almost limitless samples that, you know, we'd love to look at. The limit is just, you know, time and how many researchers there are. But absolutely, um, it's, it's so key to collaborate with different people around the world to understand this better. Yeah, it's a great question. And it sort of summarizes my feeling about the whole evening, really, is that all of you work in, you know, fairly different fields, don't you? But it, it really sounds like collaboration is absolutely key to all of your all of your professions, isn't it? Absolutely. Lots of collaborative nodding. So, yeah, I mean, it, that's what I love about being at the zoo for when it comes to collaboration. I mean, we're, 
we are we are a research institute attached to a zoo, but we do not have access to next generation sequencing. We don't have laser dissection microscopes, but we, we, we do have we do have bats and elephants and jellyfish and all sorts of things that other people don't have. And that's uh, that just opens up so many doors for these incredible collaborations where we can work together. I mean, before I mentioned you know, these Victorian scientists, gentlemen scientists who did really beautiful stamp collecting, but I mean, it would be as if Jackie were just filling up her freezer and not, not sharing it with anyone. And the, the joy comes in seeing your work, influencing other people's work and adding to other people's work and bringing all that together is, uh, is a real joy in, the, in science these days. And yes, everyone's nodding. I can sense that that is a, a feeling that everyone shares. Um, and that is exactly when uh, we were told to finish chatting, everybody. I'm sure... Um, I'm right in saying that if anyone has any burning questions that we didn't get to, that they'd, you'd be happy for people to get in touch and we'd follow up on on stuff. Um, so I guess all that remains is for me to say thank you to uh, the panelists. Thank you very much, Jacqueline McKenzie Dodd and Alex Kagan, Simon Spiro and Rob Deville. And thank you everyone at home for watching. It's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. And I believe that we're gonna have, um, Becky is gonna come back. Becky, who you met at the beginning and do a little bit of housekeeping before you all go for your dinner. Wonderful. Well, just a, a huge um, thank you for um, teaching you all to, to Jeff Marsh for guiding us through this fantastic and um, fascinating topic and to our brilliant panel, Alex, Simon, Rob and Jacqueline. Um, their, their work is so inspiring and that their um, enthusiasm and love for it, I think, really shines through. So I, I hope you've all enjoyed hearing it as much as I think we've enjoyed sharing and, and talking together. As is always the case, there are so many questions to get through um, and more than we could cover, but hopefully um, we've managed to pick up enough of the themes that were coming through. Um, if you've enjoyed this evening, please join us at our next Genome Lates. It's on the 19th of August um, and our host, um, science writer and broadcaster Katani, she'll be in conversation with a panel of guests, including the Welcome Sanger Institute's director, Professor Sir Mike Stratton, and experts from the wider world of genomics. So 25 years on from the discovery of the BRCA2 mutation, how is genomics shaping our understanding of cancer? To what extent can we predict diseases that may affect us by looking at our genes? And what other biological lifestyle and environmental factors contribute to how and why we age? We'll put a link in the chat with the website to our events page. Um, and at the bottom of that page, you can also sign up to our events uh, newsletter. So please join up and uh, keep informed about all of our future events. We'll also link to useful resources connected to our panel from this evening and to the wider discussions we've covered tonight. And um, if you'd like to watch this event again and other recordings from the Genome Late Season, or you can share them with your friends, um, please go to our Genome Gallery events page and you'll find them there uh, a little later on. We'll close tonight um, and post a, a short survey. I know everyone asks these for you, but please, if you can, just stay online for a few minutes and um, give us your, your feedback. It really does help us um, plan um, for our future events and improve them for you. So thank you once again to all of our participants and thank you very much for you for joining us um, on this very uh, warm and sunny evening. Um, take care and we'll see you again soon. Good night.